Next up, we have a very interesting panel discussion, redefining the new normal in the BFSI sector. Joining us today are some of the eminent personalities from the corporate world. Our moderator for this session, once again, is Dr. Anita Shantaram, founder of Ethics India and head of Compliance and Ethics Academy. Our first panelist for this session is Ms. Rinku Sharma, Executive Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer of SBI Card. Ms. Sharma has a global work experience across diverse areas of compliance and anti-money laundering. She is an ACAM certified specialist and has successfully completed three years of global fraud management leadership program at Washington DC, Prague and Bangkok. She has also been recognized and lauded with several prestigious awards and accolades, such as the Compliance Professional of the Year 2019 across Australia, ACAM's AML Professional of the Month 2019, Compliance Evangelist at the sixth edition of the Compliance 1010 Awards, Compliance Officer of the Year in the Compliance Platinum Register, and Women in Compliance in the years 2016 and 17, respectively. Our second panelist is Ms. Nehal Shah, the President, Head of Compliance, Legal and Secretariat at Yes Asset Management India Limited. Ms. Shah has more than 16 years of experience in compliance, secretarial and corporate governance functions of leading capital market intermediaries and listed companies in the banking and financial service sector. She has worked with organizations like Deutsche Bank Group, Aditya Birla Group and Fidelity India. She has also provided strategic and tactical leadership in the areas of secretarial, legal, compliance, risk, audit, anti-money laundering and corporate governance management along with strategic planning. She has been awarded for her outstanding performance by Deutsche Bank in 2015 and was also recognized as an excellent performer in the third edition of the Compliance 1010 by Legacies in 2015. Our next panelist is Mr. Sandeep Kapoor, Founder and Managing Director of Algo Legal. Mr. Kapoor has over 20 years of experience in investment laws, mergers and acquisition, capital markets and technology law and leads a team of over 50 lawyers across offices in Bangalore, Mumbai and New Delhi. He has worked with Sequoia Capital for over nine years and was the first legal hire globally. He has also been recognized as one of the innovative leaders in Financial Times Asia Pacific Awards 2010 and was recognized for his contribution in the year 2014 by Legacy's Compliance 10 by 10. He has been featured in Legal 500's GC Powerlist India and has been a recipient of the best in-house legal team at the Financial Times Legal Awards 2018. He is also a mentor at the Future Law Innovation Program, an initiative in collaboration with the Singapore Academy of Law. Our fourth panelist for this session is Mr. Saran Chima, the Chief Compliance Officer, PNB MetLife Insurance Company Limited. Mr. Chima is a chartered accountant with substantial experience in regulatory compliance and risk management in the Indian insurance sector. He has more than 16 years of experience in ethics and compliance, risk management, internal audit and forensics, most of which has been with the BFSI sector. He is also a qualified chartered accountant, has a bachelor's degree in commerce and has also cleared the certified information systems audit course. It's a great honor to have all of our panelists today for this panel discussion at the Compliance 1010 event. Thank you so much for taking our time to be with us. The topic that we will be discussing is navigating through challenging times, uh, redefining the normal in the PFSI sector. So we'll take a few questions across to each panelist, uh, the opening remarks, closing remarks, we all can share all uh, our thoughts. So the current pandemic has created a situation where every sector has been impacted differently. Uh, the BFSI sector with issues of compliance, uh, data privacy issues have all you know, challenged the sector. And we have some leading names here from the industry who will share their thoughts with us. One interesting uh, research that I read about the Barrett Culture Value Center what they came up with is a change in the values over pre-COVID times and now during COVID times. So very fascinating data, which has been absolutely, you know, gone to extremes. Uh, when you look at organizations valuing result orientation, it was ranked at number two pre-COVID times. 
and it has now come down to 25 number as a value for an organization. Agility has come up. It was earlier uh, rated as 43 number as a value and today it is at number eight. And I think that that's one uh, which most organizations are realizing that how agile they need to be. Uh, two more, one is employee health, which was at 61 and today it's five. I don't think we ever gave this much importance to health as we're doing now. And this one is worrying about how cautious we are. It was at 75 and today it is at 18. So I think as organizations, we are tending to be more cautious. So I thought that this was some interesting uh, data to share with you. And uh, I thought the first question is that what has been the kind of challenges that each one of you and your industry has faced and with any impact on culture or any specific uh, issues that you've been able to deal with or have been challenged with. So maybe Mr. Saran can start and then we can take it across to each one of you. Thank you, Dr. Imita. And uh, you know, thank you for having uh, me here and uh, a warm welcome to everyone as well. In terms of this unprecedented times, I think so, uh, what is important to us, uh, what we have learned is that this pandemic has, uh, has created a situation where we have, we have learned to prepare ourselves for uh, uh, testing times. I think we all, as organizations, we used to have our BCP plans, we used to have our business continuity management plans. But uh, uh, this situation brought us together in terms of testing those given the situation and preparing for, our, for serving the customers um, as we generally would want to be available with them. So I think the, the, the biggest challenge, which uh, particularly the insurance sector, I think, you know, faced was transitioning into the work from home environment quickly. You know, uh, the only saving grace which we had as, a, as an industry and as I think so it applies to other industries as well, is that uh, uh, we, we were not hit, the India was not hit by pandemic uh, as probably we saw in other uh, continents and countries. So there was some preparation time which probably was a silver lining or a saving grace for, for uh, the industry and the organizations. But having said that, when the situation was there in March uh, and, uh, and months uh, you know, following that, uh, working from home and transitioning into the work from home environment and adapting to that situation of uh, coordinating with fellow colleagues and um, employees and customers on a virtual mode, I think was the biggest aspect which uh, I think the industries including insurance industry uh, and the BFSI sector as a whole, you know, was able to uh, uh, work around. The important thing is within this challenge, um, I do believe that as a service sector, the BFSI sector has uh, uh, ensured that we continue to service the customers and uh, fulfill our promises, what we have been giving to the customers uh, all throughout. Within the overall work from home environment, I would just want to call out one aspect here was to ensure that uh, the communications with all stakeholders, including customers, are proactively made um, and they are informed with all the alternative mechanisms which the companies have made in, you know, put in place for ensuring the services and the uh, customer communication continues uh, during the non-face-to-face -face virtual environment. Uh, the regulators stepped up. The regulators did provide a lot of uh, interventions and uh, support to the, to the organizations and the industry, uh, allow, and proactively also guiding the industry in terms of how they would probably, the industry should deal with this situation, particularly on the customer communications piece. And the reason I'm stressing uh, on this particular aspect is because when we are as an organization, as the industry or as organizations, when we are faced with such situations, uh, it's 
it's natural for customers to get uh, you know a uh, uh, little concerned in terms of how the communications and services would be followed and that's when uh, the services sector and bfsi in particular it's important for ensuring that customers are communicated of a business continuity and ensuring that disruptions will be managed and their promises would be fulfilled i think so this was the biggest challenge and i i i do believe that the industry was able to step up and uh, deal with this on the backdrop of it and technology you know interventions which were there which came handy during this time anyone else can take it yeah go ahead nil nil go ahead Sure. Thanks, uh, Mr. Saran. Thanks, Dr. Anita, for uh, having us all of us together from different industry to share our thoughts. Uh, you know, on the you know kind of regimes that we are basically all of us are going through at the moment. Uh, I belong. I come from the fund management industry. Uh, you know, so of course we uh, had a couple of challenges when uh, you know we started working from home. i would say there's a huge mind shift has happened from march uh end till today i mean earlier as a kind of all of us were possibly were not so much uh, you know kind of flexible enough to work from home because we always used to kind of uh, wanted to ha- have a face to face meeting however now we are pretty comfortable uh, to work from home having meetings over the sky for uh, the microsoft meeting in fact you know over the last 6 months possibly Uh, we have uh, seen a lot of things actually in the industry in terms of audit in terms of inspections in terms of uh, material development in regulatory regime that has got implemented over the last 6 uh, months so over and above that you know whenever uh, in our industry specifically uh, there is a huge regulatory obligation when it comes to the fund management industry because that deals with the retail money of our people at large and hence you know there is a lot of obligation on us to do the regulatory filings on uh, the financial industry the specific mutual fund industry uh, they they do file approximately 400 to 500 reports in a year and on a monthly it could be around 15 to 20 so i mean the regu- some of the reports we used to file in physical actually and now this is all got digitized overnight because the regulator has said that you please file all these reports via email uh, this were the request Uh, you know earlier which possibly now got uh, you know honored uh, through this thing whatever it could be the pandemic but yes most of the reports now is is going via email uh, apart from that there were couple of uh, stringent uh, regulatory requirement you know uh, for operational perspective which also the regulators have relaxed uh, which helped us to work a uh, quite similar sleep uh, from the homes and uh, over and above that a uh, few policy decisions which were taken and which were due for implementation in the june or april like that but this, uh, the regulator have also given the extension further to implement them in a due course so i mean there is a lot of support that we received uh, from the regulator uh, throughout this journey uh and i really applaud the work which has been done by the regulator overnight over and above that while we all of us are talking about a challenging time uh which all of us are going through it but over and above it let me give you some good news also about it that over the last 6 months if you look at the folio that has been created the new customer which got introduced to the market is is a pretty good number and the same goes with a people the new investors who have created a new demand account which is all time high in last a quarter the number i was just looking at yesterday it was almost 25 lakhs in one quarter and and that is all time high when it comes to you know the new investor investing into the market so if you look at you know the retail participants have also gone up during this uh, you know the challenging time so people are more conscious about their saving their investments their growth their insurance etc etc so they are more conscious about it uh, so which is also good in a way for industry as a whole uh, is what i would actually say from my perspective and what i could just read over development that is happening that's it from my side i completely agree uh, i think both uh, sarang and nehal has uh, you know raised a very nice perspective from their industry 
If we just step back, I think the common themes which are coming up and uh, Dr. Anita, the report that you read, I think uh, stakeholder, the uh, emphasis on the word stakeholder has completely changed, uh, right? When we earlier used to say the word stakeholder priority was more stakeholders which have financial impact onto our businesses, but now softer, like our uh, family has become one of the stakeholders, very, very critical stakeholder. The definition of ecosystem has completely changed. Uh, the ecosystem in which we were operating, now the ecosystem has shifted into an environment where you know, we have to take factors of other stakeholders, people around us, the safety, health, I think those things which we used to take for granted in our life, you know, that, that has become a very important challenge in these times. And then never in the history, at least uh, you know, in my life, I have seen that the world on same day or for continuous time is shut down and everyone is you know, facing the same challenges. So I think those, those things have come up uh, uh, very interestingly. So to deal with this, now everyone is moving towards a platform kind of a strategy, right? Where things were done more in an individualistic way. We are now trying to solve the problems. Like all employees, there's a platform for um, you know, communication. As Saran said, that communication has become a very, very important piece at all of our end. Uh, right. Even when Nehal said that regulators are also, you know, supporting. And I think there is a proactive communication. First time I have seen that, that regulators are so proactively involved in solving the problems. And I think first two, three weeks were completely chaotic because nobody knew what is to happen. And I, I told my friends and my, uh, you know, uh, clients that it is going to last only for three weeks to four weeks. And today we are in month six and we still don't know how the life is going to change. But I think what regulator did, whether it is SEBI, whether it is IRDA, whether it is uh, Ministry of Finance, I think the proactive communication which has come from them has helped a lot. And the clients are expecting us to give a lot of standardized answers. For example, uh, even if it is, uh, you know, the new changes in the regulation moratorium period, which has come up from filing. So what is that moratorium period? Does it mean that it has stopped or the interest will not be applied. So all these problems, if you start raising and stacking it up, a beautiful templatization and standardized process has come. Now it's your choice. You want to communicate one-on-one -on -one basis or you can bring it on a platform and you know, put categories of the questions and you know, raise to your clients. And I think uh, uh, both Nehal and Saran uh, touched upon technology and I think tech has uh, been a Big, big differentiator. Look at it. Uh, I mean, say last year, Compliance 1010, all of us were in Mumbai in a nice hotel and, you know, discussions were going around face to face. But today, still because of technology, we are able to share our experiences. We are able to share as a community what we have gone through. And I think that has been a most, uh, you know, important differentiator, the adoption of the tech, the rate at which it has been uh, you know, done. Many of my friends used to say, "Oh, I don't know how to operate this thing. What is Zoom? What is Microsoft Meeting?" Now everyone, you know, is completely efficient in that, and they are trying to reach out to their thing. I represent a lot of people from startup community. You know, there are a lot of fintech companies which are relating to this uh, BFSI sector, and you know, their interactions with their own banks and the banks giving them lending. A lot of uh, swiftness has come. The actions are being taken very quickly because the need of the R has completely changed. Uh, bankers and the banking industry are giving tons and tons of confidence. Uh, you know, uh, in the mutual fund industry itself, I'm seeing uh, when the entire Franklin uh, you know, issue happened with respect to six schemes being shut down, the way entire industry came forward and they issued guidelines and the clarity with which it was done. I think the communication and technology and proactiveness, which was earlier taken for granted, I think those three factors have completely been out here. And that has been my uh, you know, overall experience in this. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure being associated with Compliance 1010 and being a member of this esteemed panel. And I really agree with the, my co-panelists here on most of the points. So at the outset, I would like to mention that whatever I share today are on my own personal views and not necessarily that of my organization. And I thank uh, Compliance 1010 for allowing me to be a member of this esteemed panel. So the impact of uh, COVID-19 has been unprecedented. I think all of us agree there. And the need to respond to this uncertainty and rapidly evolving ecosystem in which we operate led to changes in organizational priorities and mindset. I think our entire mindset has undergone a change. 
So even if you take, for example, the business continuity plans, I, I think this was one thing which all organizations did, uh, you know, and hopefully prayed that we will never have to invoke it. Uh, I think uh, this pandemic has tested all our carefully laid uh, BCP plans and uh, more so. I think generally you plan that one or two uh, locations will have an outage. I'm th I think this was a pan India uh, kind of a situation where I think it will go much beyond our uh, BCP plans. And, um, and the first thing I think the, the regulated sector like financial uh, services had to ensure was that we are available for our customers in these difficult times. Uh, and we are like we have a lot of remote branches. Even there, we have to be make sure that our we are there for our customers. Uh, they don't feel that we are not there. Uh, so one, this was a carefully uh, you know big perfect test for our carefully laid plans. Uh, one of the factors I think in the earlier era which we had not thought of was social distancing that we'll have to come back to our branches and maintain social distance, uh, take care of our employee health. Uh, so I think these are some of the new factors now which have come into our planning for the future, and I think it's here to stay now. Okay. So, uh, so this is uh, this was one challenge, you know, how to quickly scale up uh, on on remote working, even while maintaining, uh, you know, uh, cyber security, maintaining employee health, managing social distancing, and then you know, once uh, that plan was put it quickly in place, I think uh, most uh, agile organizations were able to put it in place quickly for the customers. However, you know, then it led to the worries and apprehensions around, you know, how would employees working in remote conditions uh, be behaving? Obviously, we expect them to be uh, high on integrity and we have a well-laid compliance culture, but it does create an apprehension. And it also creates an apprehension around data security risk. Um, uh, we do have carefully laid out uh, cybersecurity systems, uh, you know, uh, ways to catch if there's any probable data leakage, etc. So I think this is where the differentiator has come in. All the organizations which are invested heavily into BCP, into information security, I think scale up for those organizations was extremely easy. But some of the smaller organizations where it was done maybe just to just about enough to meet the regulatory guideline, uh, I, I think there was some challenge, further challenge there. Uh, so I think this is a key differentiator going on now and organizations will take these things much more seriously now. And I think with these apprehensions, I think the role of compliance professionals also came to fore. Okay, it became much more dynamic. Uh, the regulations were coming thick and fast. I think uh, with, uh, prior to the March quarter versus the March quarter, almost a 200% increase in regulations. Um, so, you know, uh, the compliance team could not say, oh, I'll revert back to you. It was a very, very dynamic atmosphere. You had to work closely with the teams, uh, parallelly educate employees uh, on, on the new risks. Uh, you know, if there's IT security risk that you envisage, then you need to educate them that what to do, what not to do. Um, the employees working remotely, so the modes of training changed, you know, as, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Mr. Sandeep said that, you know, uh, people are getting used to Microsoft Teams and Zoom now. So the whole training uh, paradigm shifted, you know, earlier you could roll out surveys, you could do face-to-face -face trainings, focus group discussions. Suddenly you move that entire scenario online. Uh, and it had to be done fast and dynamically because the regulations are coming thick and fast. Uh, the atmosphere was changing very, very fast, very dynamic. So I think the compliance team was literally on, on their toes in this era. Um, and I think the whole uh, way of conducting employee awareness and engagement has moved online. And I don't think we will go again fully back to just classroom stations. I think online is here to stay. Uh, one another aspect came was employee health and safety. It came in like never before. We had to show to our employees that uh, you know, show our empathy to them, care about their safety. Uh, and I think uh, even the regulators said that, you know, you should have some teams to manage that. Uh, so, so in mo most businesses, I think a quick response team was set up, uh, compliance professionals were part of it, senior management professionals were part of it to see that uh, how to ensure that the employees are safe, the work goes on, uh, what are the kind of uh, sanitizers or other safety measures, social distancing, how do we implement it? How do we ensure it is implemented on the ground, our employees who are a major assets, our key assets remain safe? Okay, so this was, I think, a new thing that came in. Communications, I think my fellow panelists have talked about it. I totally agree with them. This was last few months have been era of communication, digital communications, um, you know, awareness campaigns, uh, because we have to in inform our employees, even our customers of these new risks. Communication to customers has in increased manifold and customers do expect that transparency and communication from us uh, because you know, they are also in difficult times. We have to empathize with our customers because they are also in difficult times. And we have to educate them. We have to keep them aware of all these risks. Um, so I think uh, this was another uh, challenge, I think, which we faced head on and quickly came up with this. So I think it's been a very dynamic world where the compliance team had to be really on their toes. 
So my, uh, in nutshell, I would say that my observation and experience says that the organization that has demonstrated strong corporate values and acted as responsible corporate citizens during this pandemic, and, and have been, they have been effectively able to respond to this crisis. Trust plays a very key role, empathizing with the employees, empathizing with the customers, caring for their well-being, uh, while being vigilant of the risk is the mantra of success in these times. So all these can be overcome as long as we, I think, do some of these things. Uh, so that is how I would like to uh, wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Rinku, what you said about the compliance role has increased. And I found that most of the compliance professionals were completely you know, busy and longer hours than ever before. So that role has been very, very relevant and important. And an underlying theme is that you know, how we transitioned customers, the, how we take care of them, uh, employees, all the stakeholders that Mr. Sandeep was mentioning, that it has, earlier it was just a financial focus which was there. Now it's a more complete, uh, holistic uh, definition of a stakeholder. The real definition has come out. And uh, I'm wondering whether we will, as smoothly as we got into, it was a challenge, but we got into the work from home. Now getting back to work from office is going to be a greater challenge, it looks like. All those memes, I don't know if you've been watching, that people need that pressure cooker sound behind them to be able to uh, deliver and perform. So it's going to change. And uh, yeah, but it's been a common underlying, I think, experience. And again, what Rinku, you mentioned is that organizations which emphasized, which had invested, the values, all of that are the ones which would succeed. So we've had personally a great experience in our organization also with uh, Legacies. Uh, I think uh, our CEO was very proactive. Uh, he had created a group, uh, I think, uh, in November or December, the moment he heard about it. Were, and I was like, what are we doing? Nothing's going to happen. And because, you know, you remember the H1, the swine flu, situation, I said, nothing will happen. And it finally, it helped us, you know, move more smoothly and cater to our customers. Uh, and Nihal, uh, so you did mention about regulators, but I was wondering that since the regulators were also working from home, how was your experience while dealing with them uh, with regards to any audit, inquiry, inspection that would take place? And then maybe Mr. Saran could also uh, take over this uh, question. So. I know you've shared a few thoughts, but how did they handle yeah. it and how was the... So, uh, uh, as I mentioned that, you know, the fund manager industry is highly uh, kind of regulated by uh, SEBI and there is basically an annual inspection which they do across industry. So there is something called offline surveillance and there's something called on-site inspection. So off-site surveillance would keep uh, happening as a big AU activity for the regulators and for us as well, because there's an email that exchanges. However, when it comes to the on-site inspection, I think that got deferred by a few weeks. And then regulators also realized that this is not going to go very soon as a COVID scenario. So then they suggested to you guys kind of, you know, can start uh, sharing your data over the email with the auditors. Uh, of course, the confidential data are not supposed to be shared, which means like client data is a very confidential that cannot be shared over the emails. And that's the protocol that we even maintain as an organization. And at the same time, you know, some of the uh, confidential documents, such as the board minutes or something like that, we do not share them over the emails. We kind of can show them over the Microsoft meeting, team meetings or the Skype, you know, kind of show them a document over the uh, such kind of a platform. But otherwise, a sharing of such data is very, very, uh, it's not allowed. And over and above that, uh, you know, Sevi was also kind of giving us kind of a good guidance that, you know, if there is any gray area, how do we tackle? Because sometimes what happened is that uh, the auditors used to be there on the floor and do the checking as per their convenience and their comfort, you know. However, that flexibility is not there with the auditors anymore. So most of the audits and the queries and the resolutions have happened on the uh, you know, the, uh, the call like the Microsoft meeting calls or the Skype calls. And that's how we have kind of just uh, completed the audit. And that goes even for the internal audit. That's again a continuous activity because uh, the auditors who are a CA firm are not kind of forming a part of an essential service. So they cannot travel to the office. While we form part of, you know, the essential services, we used to go to office twice in a week 
or currently also we are going to office once or twice in a week depends on a need to need basis however the auditors it was strictly no they cannot travel so most of the work including the annual audits the internal audits the stat audits your secretarial audit all happened through the emails and the comfort they got it from the management and that's where i think overall the audit also piece got very streamlined over the last 6 months now so that's about of uh, the audit and inspection uh, over and above that uh, the dealing with the regulator it is basically i must appreciate uh, that the way they are kind of handling the entire situation of course earlier we always used to reach out to them over the landline now we always reach out to them on the cell phone and believe me they are all are approachable excellent exceedingly well and you know certain situation arises and then you really need to speak to them you know because of the regulatory clarification or some kind of an even with it have happened but they always been approachable uh, you know you can just ping them on the whatsapp they would really reward very quickly and those kind of kind of they are also very sensitive to the uh, overall situation especially like you know the industry which is very dynamic actually speaking so they were pretty sensitive and they were they were always always open to even honor the representation that has gone from uh, you know the amc or the the, uh, the industry level to the sebi so so that's again gone very well and it's pretty uh, managed very well by the regulator the whole situation in the industry uh if you look at sebi possibly would have issued uh, from march till today must have issued more than 75 circulars on related to covid which includes the relaxations you know extensions exemptions uh temporary relaxations across all the capital market industry and, and they have done a very nice thing in you know, the regulator especially sebi is that they have created a separate page you know which only deals with the covid exemptions so that has done extremely well overnight they have done this they created this page and they, they started kind of uploading all the circulars on this uh, you know the dedicated page on the sebi so it is easy to go and just find out you know when was the earlier last extension and when is because they, they are extending every month certain things actually speaking so it's important for compliance officer and it's give very it, it gives a lot of comfort to compliance officer that it's very easily uh, readable and it's it's good in fact to see the such a proactive approach from the regulator i think we didn't find any issues when it comes to the getting clarifications getting any kind of uh, exceptions whatever it could be it went off very well during the 6 months thank you yeah so i think you know it was uh, from an insurance industry perspective uh, i think it was uh, pretty much uh, in line with what our friend nehal mentioned but in particularly i would just uh, draw out a few points here so while i touch upon the inspection piece a little later i think you know insurance being an ins- essential service uh, while the industry also went into a work from home environment and the regulator also went into a work from home environment and the moment you know the uh, the, uh, the ministry clarified about insurance being essential service the regulator did in a in a phased manner uh, come back to office on a rotation basis and the insurance companies also started its branch operations uh, and in some parts wherever it was feasible their central operations as well from working from office perspective in a roster environment having said that in that context so there are two things which happened one uh, the regulator uh, i think the insurance industry was very pleased to see a uh, regulatory direction proactive regulatory direction coming on two front one mm-hmm. on the topic which we have spoken in um, earlier as well in terms of uh, to protect the interest of the customers so you know uh, whether it was related to the how we communicate with the customers for alternate servicing mechanisms second was allowing them dispensations uh, allowing dispensations to the customers for managing their policies if i may just call out an example is extending the grace period to pay renewal premiums and the regulator took into cognizance the situation which was there the stress in the environment uh, uh, probably some time which is required for banks or the uh, inst- financial institutions to come together to process the payment and in that process the policy holder should not have policy lapsations and probably stay without an insurance cover so there was a proactive communications and the the industry uh, had 
complied with the directives issued by the regulator in the, on that front. So while the, there were directives which came from a policyholder protection perspective, at the same time, the regulator uh, taking into account the pandemic situation and uh, insurance company, how it's required to uh, function during this situation, it also directed insurance companies to do a risk assessment and monitoring of various vital parameters which are required for insurance companies to function during this uh, period. And uh, so while these directions were there, at the same time, we also, coming back to the point which uh, Dr. Nita what you mentioned, on the regulatory inspections, there was, you know, even the insurance regulator has a particular pattern of inspecting the insurance companies and in fact the intermediaries as well you know the corporate agents or brokers etc and uh, and we were pleased to see that the regulator transitioned into a new age inspection uh, mechanism which was on virtual mode off site uh, working through you know virtual meetings and taking into account a lot of off site on you know uh, data submissions which were made by uh, the, uh, the insurance companies which were being inspected and the regulator for the initial part of the period when the you know uh, uh, the transition into a virtual remote on you know inspection process when this was uh, made live i think it was a learning for the regulator and for the insurance industry as well because you know Traditionally or normally, we were used to seeing the regulator on site in our offices and, you know, working together for uh, the scope of the inspection. Now, this being off site, obviously, there were learnings which came through. Uh, the learnings are, again, in two, on two fronts. One, in terms of how do we plan the overall process, pre-inspection and during the course of inspection. Obviously, there was, uh, it, had, it had to be on a virtual mode. And within that aspect also coordination of, and here the role of compliance became extremely important uh, because the compliance function had to be a bridge between uh, the various internal functions and the regulator to ensure seamless data communications flows through um, and clarifications as required are also provided on time and as required. And the second learning which was there was in terms of uh, use of new age tools to conduct these um, inspections. So I think Nihal mentioned about uh, the sensitivity towards sharing of information, how this can be sent across in a safe and uh, controlled environment. And uh, I think the regulators uh, did uh, uh, appreciate that and they have been uh, you know, patient in terms of understanding this particular aspect, you know, which are the information which can be transmitted, which are the information which cannot be transmitted. Um, I'll just give an example, like the regulators generally would uh, want access to some of the systems of the insurance companies to uh, independently verify some data. Now, this was again, you know, this was managed by the inspection team and the uh, uh, insurance companies through sharing of uh, you know uh, the screens on a virtual meeting environment mode rather than giving access on their machines because uh, the IT security policies would come in play. Now, uh, while these are smaller examples, but I just thought I'll just share those. So I think there was a lot of learnings this pro in this process and I do believe that uh, remote inspection would be, uh, would be a new way of uh, 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 the regulators uh, uh, transitioning and working on the inspection for uh, uh, entities in the BFSI sector. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Just, just to just to add one thing, uh, what to Saran add is that uh, across BFSI sector, it is RBI who has already started the offsite inspection. I believe three to five years back. Uh, followed that, SEBI also has started for a uh, few intermediaries such as uh, custody, uh, to some extent broker, and the mutual funds, uh, which is called offsite surveillance. And I'm sure this will also pass on to other regulators, let's say PFRD or IRDA. Uh, this is all in addition to the on-site inspection, which basically they do it on an annual basis. Sure. Things that had so much resistance earlier 
is going to become a norm soon. Remote inspection and things like that. Even if some have started it, but for many, it's uh, there's a huge resistance. But physically, we need to be there. Physically, we need to see things. But I'm sure it impacts even data protection. But then it has its pros, it has its cons, and we have to make the most of that. Uh, so, uh, Rinku, uh, during a situation like this, like a pandemic, what are the key compliance requirements that you would say are important? Also, because of the situation, uh, things like mobile uh, fraud, banking frauds are taking place, uh, phishing, all of that has been on the rise. Yeah. So how would organizations need to address these issues so that we get the benefits of everything and not the uh, cons of the situation? Yeah, very good point, uh, Dr. Anita. So, you know, COVID-19 has led to significant structural and behavioral changes in the economy, and they're likely to continue in the near future. So the need of the R, Dr. Anita, in my view, is a resilient uh, financial institution, uh, which is good in governance, has effective risk management, uh, and is very adaptive towards business continuity and robust internal controls. So, you know, I think the regulator is doing their bit. We have to do our bit. And while doing this, we should not forget that people are the most important asset. Um, they need to be agile in this period and their well-being and reskilling is very important. Um, so if we say risk management, what should we have? So it needs to be sophisticated. Uh, it should be sophisticated enough to smell vulnerabilities brewing within the business well in advance, should have some predictive analytics. And it should be very dynamic to capture the looming risks in sync with the changes in environment. It cannot be a very static kind of a system where you put the scorecard once and you know let it be. It has to be very, very dynamic and continuously leverage on best practices. So besides this, I think a very important component is that the organization should have strong uh, compliance and ethics culture. Uh, the cost of compliance should be perceived as an investment and should go beyond what is legally binding and attempt to embrace a broader standards of integrity and ethical con conduct. I think we need to take it to a, a very big level. We already do. However, I think it, it will play a much bigger role now on. And this will ensure that we maintain a high degree of ma market reputation, uh, which is imperative for retaining customers. Uh, yes, while it is important for protection of our own assets, it's also this is what builds customer trust ultimately. And uh, this is what will command uh, higher valuation among the investors. I think the investors also look for organizations which have uh, you know, very high on ethics and compliance and integrity. So one important aspect, as you touched, of risk management relates to incident of frauds um, cyber related or otherwise, which have come to light in the recent times. You know, just to give you an example, uh, in UPI al alone, uh, there have been transactions worth 1.8 billion in September 2020 itself, okay, uh, valuing almost uh, rupees 3.29 trillion. Okay, so, uh, and this is done one, one aspect I'm uh, quoting as an example. So there's a huge digitization. And this has opened the possibilities and avenues for cybersecurity threats, scams, frauds, and compliance breaches. So if we take some of the recent publications, uh, it's been quoted that there has been almost 500% increase in cybersecurity incidents since lockdown. Scammers and fraudsters are finding the situation you know, very good for themselves. They have become smarter and they're taking advantage of technology. Uh, they're duping customers. At the same time, there's humongous rise in phishing as well. Uh, it is quoted that phishing has uh, in, uh, you know, increased almost three to four times. So these are uh, huge incidents. Every day, uh, there are some reported incidents of data leakage and cases and business email compromises uh, in the media. If, if you read the newspapers, it's very much there. The, uh, the regulator also says, at least RBI says, that the frauds have more than doubled. So, you know, so obviously, this is a very, very risky world, and we need a very strong compliance network to manage it. And, and you know, to some extent, this is also, it's not like there's never been any collusion. Some of these could be influenced by unethical practices and uh, compromises in integrity. And just to quote some data there, in a recent survey by ENY, uh, it was said that 22% of employees globally have felt the pressure to bend the rules, okay? And 43% uh, of the managers globally said they would sacrifice their integrity for the short term. Uh, it, I, I would not like to say it, but, uh, but the data quoted for India was even higher percentage, you know. So uh, that tells us that we need to be uh, very innovative and smarter in monitoring our systems, tracking such happening. So one is that we need to have a strong culture. Uh, however, I personally feel culture alone would not help. We also need to put in sophisticated analytics uh, which uh, you know looks at the data on a, on a dynamic nature and, and and pops up alerts for us 
that this is going out of the trend and this is what we need to deep dive into. So I think the actual need of an R is that the compliance has to marry the technology uh, and build with digital platforms at the same time remain connected with the customers, you know, uh, communicate transparently with them. Uh, so uh, this is definitely a risky one. I totally agree with you. And uh, uh, so this is the uh, internal aspect of the organization where you have to put these huge controls. The second part is that uh, how do we make life easier for our customers while coping up with these risks? You know, so customers are looking for social distancing. They are looking more at digital work. So we have to obviously educate them about these risks on a regular basis, not that one-time communication that we sent in the previous era. It has to be a regular kind of a communication with them. Uh, we have to leverage some of the new tools which our regulators have given, like eKYC, then video KYC, uh, which are very convenient from the customer. You know, they can operate at uh, VKYC, they can do it from the comfort of their home. At the same time, these tools are electronic and they also prevent frauds. Uh, if you do an EKYC or VKYC, it's a much safer world than a, than a normal uh, physical uh, document collection. So it is good for the customers. It is good for security. So in my view, uh, a successful post-pandemic compliance should include these key considerations. And they have to be worked on very carefully in a very strategic and smart and diligent manner. That's what I feel. Thank you, uh, Rinku. So uh, you brought, uh, you know, you highlighted ethics. And so I said, I have to get in the ethics question here because uh, that's something encompassing. It's relevant for everyone. And uh, you, the data that you highlighted was something that, was it related to the pandemic situation? The ENY report that you're talking of? Was it during this situation that more bending the rules or was it an uh, overall uh, report? Uh, the, the data that I quoted is definitely post pandemic. Uh, and uh, these are the surveys which have come in. So when I started my, uh, you know, when I responded to you, I mentioned that there have been structurally economic changes in our, in our, uh, in our world. And I think these are what are leading to these new trends. So this is very much a new trend that we are witnessing. And I think we have to be cognizant of that and tweak our compliance strategy and our integrity, how we want to build it, how we want to communicate it in view of this new trend. That's what I feel. You know, research is such that it goes either way. It goes both ways. So when uh, the situation today, uh, there may be more misconduct and frauds. Uh, there is a study by ERC, Ethics Resource Center, which says that when the economy is booming, there's a greater amount of fraud. Uh, there's more misconduct happening. Maybe, you know, everyone can, uh, you know, there's no pressure on us. So we have data which looks at more misconduct when there is uh, economy booming, there's more misconduct when uh, the recession is there or tough times are there. What do each one of you feel is the situation? Do you think it has uh, organizations are finding it a challenge to stick to ethics and what can they do to ensure or how important you feel uh, ethics is uh, for in today's situation or in times like this. So maybe Sandeep, you can take the start off and uh, Ringu has shared a lot of data and anyone else. You know, on a lighter note, Dr. Anita, before I, I think Sandeep takes in, I would like to mention Forsters always make hay, okay? So the organizations have to be ready all the time. <laughs> you very rightly said they make hay when the business is booming. But yes, with digitization coming in and, you know, and uh, sorry, economic times, uh, yeah, I think they come to the fore. So uh, I, I agree with you totally. They make hay both the times. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I, I also feel that, uh, you know, the need for ethics and to be ethically compliant or to be, I think we need to uh, divorce the words ethics and compliance compliance because compliance is more of a, you know, as you call it, tick in the box kind of a thing, whereas the word ethics goes beyond, you know, overarching thing. As Sohas Bhai always says that, you know, to say that from an organization perspective, I have to be ethical is something not right. There is something missing because ethics is something which makes you uh, and it equally makes any organization going. And yes, uh, Brinko is absolutely right that not only, uh, you know, the ways in which fraudster, fraudsters are looking at, uh, you know, damaging the system or making hay is increasing. I think the vulnerability has also increased because imagine many organizations gave access to their IT system and all within their environment to an employee. Now, suddenly those systems were transported. I know 
uh, I am an investor in an early stage e-commerce company, and they made huge killing because uh, one of the thing which uh, you know their delivery boys were asked to do was ship, uh, you know, the IT systems to the employees' homes, right? Whether it was Wipro in Bangalore, they got seven hundred and fifty rupees for per shipping into that. Now, when you are shipping the physical system, are you also creating the same environment where you know you are creating the same IT network and doing the things? And you are right. Uh, I mean, say. a lot of employees if you see the recent uh, cases which are being filed by the organizations against the data theft or or you know dealing with the competitors and leakage of information or creating credit card frauds all that data in the recent time has really gone up i'm sure a study will come up when they will do the blue collar crime i spoke to sohas bhai the other day and he said they are doing going to understand a data analysis on the blue collar crime but this is a you know an invitation where this has happened because now the monitoring has changed but uh, at the same time organizations are going very deep in terms of training reemphasizing the messages and i think uh, the cyber resilience is a new concept which is coming up which people have to understand that they cannot now uh, shrug off from not investing in the best cyber security practices the monitoring which has to be done is of a different level the access through which an employee can do i i know certain clients who ask me that is it okay if employees are logging into the system from their own personal laptops and i said these are the vulnerabilities you are exposing yourself into right so rinku rightly said saran rightly mentioned there is all, always an arbitrage between the cost of buying new it equipment securing it and making it implemented at uh, you know work from home destinations versus the cost Uh, of you know or the profitability because profitability is also going down if you see the sales and some of those some some of the industries are really struggling uh, they are completely having no uh, you know access to the thing and i think it's it's that's when your strong ethical uh, you know foundations will come into picture because if organizations are now waking up to ethics and they are trying to reinforce the message i think they have already missed the bus it is an ongoing continuous process it is a a uh, revalidation of the message day in and day out that you know there is it can be in multiple forms it can be a simple email connected to all employees or when all hands are being done uh, one one other lighter way joke is that many of the managing partners and managing directors and directors are now more available to the employees and employees are saying that they were not even talking to us uh, pre pandemic and suddenly they're all more accessible i think these sessions should be used to start uh, you know re uh, enforcing the message and second thing is i think uh, we are designing lot of training material for our uh, customers and clients who want to get constant engagement with the employees and they are making it mandatory for example foreign corrupt practices act lot of my venture capital funds who have invested in a portfolio companies are running this program where once in a month key management people kmps of all portfolio companies have to sign in into a program and they have to take a 15 to 20 minute kind of a session so we are designing that so that message is also reinforced uh, because if an employee has not come to an office environment and they are working from home uh, you know there is every chance that they can miss understanding the importance of some of these uh, you know requirement and uh, at the same time uh, just wanted to share a uh, lot of new standards are also being enforced uh, for cyber resilience cyber security which can prevent your phishing and other thing monitoring earlier was mostly external now there are a lot of internal monitoring measures which are being uh, you know advocated across uh, compliance and ethics panels uh, i think one big question uh, on the ethics side which is coming up is how much to monitor your employees is it okay if i am doing a proactive penetration test on an it system being run by an employee is it okay if i do a more vigilance uh, in terms of what in built inbound and outbound data is going from an employee uh, you know communication system these are the new ethics questions because one is my own privacy rule other is uh, how much i'm going to intervene or interfere into a day to day communication with the employees you know these new sensitive topics are also coming up unfortunately uh, there is no precedents which are saying what is right what is wrong but i think lot of international compliance and ethics bodies are getting connected and a consensus is getting developed that you know what is right or wrong and rinko nicely mentioned about the surveys and some one survey which we are helping one of our client 
is to go back to their employees and understanding that what we are doing is right or wrong please tell us what is a threshold but i always advise clients that are uh, you know employee is one of the stakeholder in the system you have to manage because your main duty is towards your customers towards your ship so there is there is a series of you know importance of stakeholders there are multiple corporate governance theories around that but, but you know if by relaxing your policy particular employee or set of employees are becoming more uh, you know uh, in a position to violate the policies you have to you know go on the other side and block them so i think interesting questions are out interesting times are out and a uh, lot of new rules will be written during this time and uh, yeah i think things are evolving so maybe i, I can just uh, you know um, add to what sandeep mentioned i completely agree with uh, what's uh, Uh, you know sandeep articulated is uh, uh, that ethics and ethical culture is uh, extremely important and it it it's uh, a pod is only going to grow uh, in the situation which we are into and the new normal which we are going to see from now i think i completely agree with that and i also agree on the other point which sandeep mentioned was that it's about employee engagement and uh, training and awareness and uh, just to expand on that particular point from my side i think the uh, as all organizations in the bfsi sector and in general as well i think there is no denial that we all agree that uh, ethics and values play an important role into our corporate conduct and we we have necessary conduct documents uh, you know we have our value systems we have our value values which we communicate to our employees but this is the time which it's important that these are communicated very very transparently and empathetically uh, to the organization and all the constituents of the organization so one is the communication and the second one is in terms of i think as organizations we are it's important for all of us to we validate our structured training programs uh, for our employees specifically emphasizing on our value systems and our uh, ethical policies our ethics policies uh, whether it's at the time of uh, onboarding an employee into the system and reemphasizing at periodical intervals um, as a preventive measure i think so this is one area in my view uh, uh, as organizations will have to go back and uh, see what we can do to to ensure that there is no gap in communication to our employees generally we you know there are so many instances which we come across that where employees do mention and particularly this is relevant in organizations where there are hundreds and thousands of employees where uh, you know uh, employees or you know communities may argue out that you know they may not they were not aware about a particular uh, company policy or a particular value system by obviously you know ethical conduct it starts as uh, sandeep also mentioned it's it's a personal trait first then a then a company trait uh, but it's also important for the employee to also understand that how the personal trait and the the value system of the company you know how it aligns and because th- to ensure that there is no misalignment you no know, uh, it's important that the same value systems and you know what our policies are they are communicated through training programs which are much more engaging rather than just you know one sided communications where the employees go through pages and say i have understood it and they sign off i think that used to be you know but i, I don't think so that is going to be Uh, how uh, other companies have to function so training and awareness becomes extremely important and i do also agree with what sandeep mentioned in terms of what has to be the monitoring mechanism to keep on dip sticking and take necessary measures to post correct wherever required i think and that is a larger area anyways you know uh, to uh, to talk about my point of view there specifically is uh, i think uh, in the new normal but what we are going to see uh, it's certainly important that from a cyber security risk perspective 
the new age tools are used and i think the, the particularly the bfsi sector has adopted and if i if i might talk about insurance because insurance companies uh, do manage a lot of uh, personal data of customers monitoring of uh, you know behavior in a work from home environment uh, was paramount and uh, companies have uh, deployed uh, data leakage prevention tools and monitoring of dlp tools during this environment to ensure that uh, you know uh, the behavior is monitored and necessary steps are taken uh, to ensure uh, you know, things are corrected and uh, prevented as required uh, i have one uh, related question uh, saran uh, uh, dr neeta if i may uh, you know just clarify from both Sa- saran and nehul how much changes in your respective sectors are enforced by the regulators or it was voluntarily done by the industry as such because if uh, i see insurance i see mutual fund both of them are highly regulated sector so one is that industry adopting to some of these best tools and practices on their own but i also like to give a lot of credit to the regulators to you know bring and emphasize upon adoption of some of these best practices on an ongoing basis so is there any yeah. data point you guys have got or i mean say how much credit you want to give to regulators also uh, uh, you know in terms of this process i think the companies particularly insurance companies did adopt uh, a lot of these preventive measures from a cyber security perspective proactively and particularly if i may talk about my company we did that we have been doing it for all this while but i do want to give a uh, whole credit to the regulator as well because uh, i think so they, you know the regulator did come out with a comprehensive guidance note on cyber security and information security and and it laid down standards for all companies to follow whether it was from a preventive steps or a detective steps perspective and also ensured that we do an annual reporting to the regulator Mm-hmm. uh on the health of uh, cyber security controls which the which the companies have and i think that regulate the monitoring from the regulator obviously you know uh, what it did was it obviously made it very clear to the sector that uh, this is one area which it's important from a regulatory perspective as well and while there were you know internal mechanisms to uh, uh, review and give comfort at adequate governance uh, bodies level but the regulator what one added layer which the regulator brought in was to take an independent confirmation from a cert in certified auditor and give that independent confirmation to the respective company's board and uh, as well as the regulator now that added layer obviously brings uh, you know uh, added amount of comfort as well internally and as well to the regulator as well so i i do uh, you know believe that the regulator is very very you know serious about this aspect i think it's the need of the rs well uh, yeah i would uh, certainly agree with uh, saran who gave a, a, a fair view of the industry uh, insurance industry from asset management industry also we have experienced a similar uh, expectation from the regulator because again it deals with the retail money mutual fund industries generally are a retail uh, you know investors industry and hence uh, sebi has always been extremely uh, sensitive towards the investors and they have always expected that fund houses should have a robust information technology setup uh, to ensure that the data should not be leaked investor data should be protected uh, not only that in our industry we have like a registrar and transfer agent uh, who basically uh you know takes care of the investors database uh so there also the rnt regulations of the regulator is also extremely strict uh, which also applies to the registrar you know basically there are two biggest registrar in our industry one is cams and one is carvi uh, or k or they have changed the name because recently k fintech so so these are the basically two or three uh, rta which are the predominantly in the industry and and they also have to they uh, the equal restrictions is been put in on the rta also to ensure that they have uh, adequate uh, technology uh, team and uh, adequate support and they also have to file those system audit report and the cyber security audit report with the regulator and so as here the asset management industry also has to file 
the system audit report and also the cyber security audit report now cyber security audit report as uh, mentioned by saran it is a recent development of last two years uh, but you know as far as uh, system audit report is concerned it's been there for almost now six to seven years so a lot of uh, of course uh, the expectation is pretty high when it comes to uh, such things but at the same time organization also is equally cognizant uh about uh, you know if they do not have such things and what things can go wrong and you know there is a lot of high reputation stakes involved so most of the players in the industry uh, will have a extremely robust uh, mechanism to protect the invested database to to ensure that the data is not leaked to ensure that uh, certain the social uh, network websites are blocked on the computers uh you know this also is coming from uh you know your insider trading regulation that you know uh, you know and also to the circular which states that you know there should not be rumors uh to be spread by any capital market intermediaries so there is a lot of onus has been put on the industry uh which prevents any spread of the rumors also so that's where i think overall uh, the mechanism works and and it works pretty efficiently uh all in about that i would just make one uh, suggestion on uh, ethics ethics part is that uh, you know of course training is very important your continuous communication with the stakeholder is very very critical at the same time you know sometime it is also important to run the quiz amongst the stakeholders that how would they behave in certain scenario uh so that you get a glimpse so you know the behavior of the certain employees and if you think the answer is not as per the most ethical answer kind of thing definitely you know you can have a more uh, close oversight on the particular employees uh, not only that you know there is some there is also a something called a red flag concept across the globe especially in global organization where uh, you know they do issue a red flag uh, to an employee who are uh, failing on a part of ethics issue and uh, that does impact uh, their you know incentives or the performance appraisal so that would also create some kind of a fear amongst the employee to behave in a right way because then the action could be taken against them so i mean such things also is very important to 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 prevent uh, the ethics issue uh, so sarang and nehal training cannot be over emphasized you know you have to keep doing it it's like someone says can you really teach ethics i say that what if we don't teach you know that's the question that needs to be asked and uh, sandeep i loved what you said about that today is not the time to wake up to ethics you know then the, they've already missed the bus yeah. it can only be reemphasized it can only you know continue and uh, the other point that you mentioned about more founders and uh, ceos the top management being available to the employees so this is the best time to be able to reemphasize the values this is the opportunity that they're getting because it is top down who have to you know uh, share that and there's the more you talk about ethics the more possibility is there that we will be able to follow it i ignore it it's not going to happen so thanks so much for all the insights it started with rinku and all of you have given and for me this is the highlight of the <laughs> conversation whenever uh, ethics is emphasized i feel the compliance may not be needed if everyone was operating we wouldn't need something like compliance and that's why suhas says compliance for choice his whole philosophy because that's how we matched i said uh, you're talking of compliance i think ethics is more important and when he said compliance for choice i completely agree that yes he's looking at it also from an ethical perspective and not just tick the box approach so we're moving towards uh, the closure of uh, the session but to one question before that to sandeep is uh what are the gray areas in law and which you feel that we need to focus on a tweak or address that the bfsi sector can uh, you know deal with it better so any thoughts on that there are two or three aspects which uh, uh you know current time has opened up the entire force majeure clauses the contractual policies and and the best practices around that uh, uh because uh, it's not that uh, you know the sector is trying to avoid any of their duties it is that the way a duty is to be performed or the rights are to be you know governed new challenges have come up because a pandemic was never in the definition of force majeure event 
if you see the contractual analysis, 98 plus percent of contract, like the word pandemic started coming into the contracts, uh, you know, maybe post SARS and some of the recent things, but still the industry doesn't have it. The government came up with a circular saying that if, uh, you know, uh, COVID is covered in a force major situation, if you have covered certain kind of work. I think a clarity is required, uh, you know, from whether it is regulatory intervention or whether the company is coming up with some best practices that, uh, you know, if I have taken a, let's say, a business uh, loss policy and today because of six months of lockdown, there is a business loss. Am I entitled to claim those damages or not? Uh, UK court in September has come up a beautiful judgment and they have said, what are the kind of losses which can be covered under the definition of business loss during this time, right? Uh, and they have given a very nice detailed sector by sector analysis that if you are in this sector, whether it is an emergency services sector or not. And I think that's one area where a lot of losses are going around, uh, you know, in, in and around the time. I think second, second important thing is regulators have given a lot of moratoriums, uh, you know, in terms of the filings and compliances. But still, there is a lot of uncertainty going on, which is saying that is the moratorium only on filing or the interest payments are also being stopped or we need to be compliant with that? What about the delayed payments? I think that's one area which needs to be, again, from a regulatory point of view, looked into very uh, in greater detail. Uh, this entire NCLT uh, you know, stoppage, a lot of companies are under as asset reconstruction kind of uh, bids are being given huge amount of money is stuck up because NCLT has been put on hold. Their operation has been put on hold. But I think the entire industry is going to suffer if those legal clarifications are not out, how NCLT will deal with those cases. Many cases, the new bidders have filed their bid, consortiums have given their bids, and the process is stopped. And I think there are many such challenges uh, which, which has an impact on the finance sector or banking sector, which is going to come up. A lot of uh, consumer court cases are being, you know, the judiciary is completely struggling. If you, if you ask me today, what is the percentage of cases going on online? I've been part of some of the arbitration hearing. I've been part of some of the court proceedings. But when you see those poor judges who have never even taken a printout of their own, they have been calling their court clerks and to even to open up their, uh, you know, uh, PCs or their uh, laptops. And, you know, even I, I know without naming and with due respect to judiciary, the training has been completely lacking. I know it's not a legal question, but it's an overall legal ecosystem, which is very, very clear, uh, which is, which is, which is, you know, really affecting the entire machinery because, you know, compliance with the law is one piece of it, but the result of the justice, whether there is a justice properly delivered and timely deliverance of the justice is also becoming a big issue now because there are a lot of these commercial disputes. I know certain fund houses which have filed cases against the portfolio companies because of fraud, but police has not been able to do any investigation because of the social distancing norm and people are taking it for granted. So I think this entire thing has to be sorted out and uh, regulators and uh, I think the law enforcers more than regulators, the enforcement machinery or uh, various police stations, your economic offense wing, your cybersecurity wings, they have to come up with some more speedy kind of, you know, disposal of the cases. And I think those those are my high-level points and observations. So, yeah, so I would like to add uh, one or two points, uh, you know, uh, on the regulatory reforms in VFSI sector. So currently we do have a KYC norm, uh, but for the capital market industry and for insurance industry and for banking industry, there are separate KYC norm. So, so there has to be a uniform KYC which should come at the at a pan-India level across VFSI sector so that the client doesn't have to give the documents again and again to a various intermediary, be it banking or be it capital market or be it insurance industry. While regulators have taken a lot of efforts in streamlining this entire KYC, uniform KYC project, and that's where central KYC uh, as a registrar came into picture, but still I think the work is done halfway. It's still needed it to do a lot of work to make it streamlined because that's where uh, the client can uh, enter into the markets easily because they do not like to give the documents uh, again and again to a various bid insurance, banking, mutual funds, stockbroking, custody. I mean, you look at uh, the plight of the customer. 
so if there is a one agency uh, which takes care of all the documentations they become the repository of the document of a client and you know they are the one who would basically renew the kyc in a year's time like one year three years five years depends on the risk categorization uh, so that it makes whole life so simple in the financial sector uh, you know and and of course it needs lot of work and lot of uh, interconnected regulation also needs to be relooked at it to uh, you know amend if required so this is a one piece of the uniform kyc across the sector and second thing is about an account opening uh, formality across again sector uh, is that it has been digitized with a video kyc or e kyc and etc etc because of most of the players have come out with online account opening or you know etc etc but you know there is one requirement which says that you need to take the signature on a physical letter which talks about power of attorney in 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 especially in, in the case of the capital market space you know if the broker uh, has to open an account it needs a power of attorney right and that power of attorney has to be wet signature now i mean in the digit, in, in the scenario like covid i think it will be difficult for anyone to you know approach client and take the signature so possibly that also needs to be transformed uh, and it has to make a otp based uh, you know the compliance uh, so there are two basically compliance which would ease out from a client perspective and from the intermediary perspective thank you so much so uh, now final question and closing thoughts on the subject one is that if you look at it as we are emerging slowly uh, i mean without a vaccine we can't say we are out of the pandemic but we are getting back to work and i feel many are even fed up and saying that let's just throw caution to the wind uh, we are emerging out of it in a slow manner because the traffic in mumbai is like nearly back to its usual self so i don't know where all these people are going if they're not going to work so trust transparency agility these are the three words that i am saying whether it's from a customer perspective from an employee perspective or from an employer these are the key and i think another word which are rinku and sandeep highlighted resilience i feel that that's another very very powerful word this is what would define the way we ought to be so what are your thoughts on it and any thing that you would let people go back with that how the future is going to look i know we are not fortune tellers but what you imagine the future to be looking like for your sector or for general work or for employees as well as everyone yeah so rinku you can start off and so um so uh, dr anita what i would say is that one we are here for the customer okay so customer trust is uh, paramount okay which starts by delivering on promises and develop with transparency and it is further stand then when you continue to deliver on those promises consistently okay so i think uh, and while doing that given that we are into now this digital world we have to ensure protection for our uh, customers i think all our panelists talked about the regulatory framework which has come in for cyber security yes that is very important it provides us a guiding force uh, however what i feel is that the organizations which will survive are the ones who will not who will go much beyond what the regulator is expecting us to do Uh, regulator is giving the broad uh, framework we have to build processes guidelines train our resources put new age tools to ensure that our customers data is protected our customers are protected from frauds and and thereby we build customer trust keeping them engaged so customer trust is in my view uh, paramount and uh, businesses which will uh, think of it as a cost all these investments as a cost will not survive in my view uh, we have to go much beyond i think this is what this pandemic has really brought brought in all those uh, organizations which are already prepared with you know sensitive info security tools which are made way beyond what the regulator required had a deep uh, you know compliance culture ethics which were made investments in these uh, things much beyond what the regulator required i think they have doing pretty well and pretty resilient in this pandemic uh, so i think this is one thing that i've learned from the pandemic that you know you don't wait for a pandemic for all these things to do these are basics which you must do not look it as a cost look it as an investment and you know just to uh, again quote some uh, data uh, idc has done a survey and they said that 79% of the companies have admitted that post covid 19 the digital transformation budgets have increased by 79% which is huge okay and 55% of the businesses believe that they have a less than a year before they start to suffer financially and lose market share so you know if you wait for a pandemic to go in for digital transformation 
for uh, you know building uh, putting it security tools and and there are state of art tools available in the market today which can you know prevent as much as you want you just need to invest in them fraud detection tools so if you're waiting for a pandemic to do all that uh, i i i think will uh, uh, lose customer trust uh, these are some things which are take have to be taken as hygiene uh, regulator is doing their bit you know they have transformed the whole uh, kyc scene to quite an extent in a very short time uh, so you know regulators have done their bit we have to do ours uh, we don't need a pandemic to do that for our consumers you know because um, ultimately that's what matters so digital transformation is the way to go and for that we need to put in strong systems uh, strong protection measures um, strong communication to customers care about em- employee health and care about customer health as well you know nobody wants to come to offices to sort out their stuff they want everything to be done from the comfort of their house uh, so i think that is the way forward is what i would say it has led to digital transformation in my view has led to immense opportunities and uh, today's uh, digital conscious customers rate organizations on their digital experience first uh, only post that they look at something else uh, so that is in my view how it has transformed really I think very nicely said, uh, Drinko. Uh, have you also done a degree in economics? The way you throw <laughs> data is so so uh, fascinating, right? Uh, just just getting. I think. Uh, I I would just respond to that. So no, I am not an economist. Okay. However, you know what I realize is that if you have data with you, it helps you uh, get all the necessary budgets and the approvals much easier. You know, and it, it and and you are not relying just on your gut. You are relying on some hardcore facts. So. No, no, I completely agree, and. Uh, yeah. Uh, the need for data and uh, emphasis has never been important i strongly recommend a book called factfulness i don't know if some of you have read i just love that book my entire perspective to solve any problem has changed because i saw look for data and then you know the problem become very easy and i completely agree with you i think what it has done is uh, my need for digital information digital uh, best practices was always there right now the message is loud and clear that if you don't change now you know yeah. then you will not get uh, will get a second window because customers are going to rate you on their digital experience of ease of doing business with you and that in- encompass many many different kind of small small subset of issues whether it is my login it is my access to my problem solver my access to my service manager and and today because i don't have to commute that means i have 1.5 to 2 hours extra time available and that time is going into expecting more demand for my own services yeah. like customers or or your employee as a customer is expecting a lot more from you as an organization that you know what trainings are you giving for me in turn to become more efficient to deal with company's customer which are i am handling as you know part of my ecosystem and i think the most important thing which is there and i'll just take a clue from what nehal said there's a time to become more and more efficient guys because i'm i'm just uh, you know thanks to sarang and nehal for sharing their problem i'm hearing cyber security policy by insurance regulators i'm hearing same policy by sebi and if you see this uh, you know regulatory lack of interconnect if one uh, kyc is already being done by one customer why you are forcing different industry to go for different kyc norms i think that is one thing and if you are look at the wastage here because different regulators and different ministries and different sectors are coming and spending time on the same issues why can't there be a back end collaboration there can be a you know for example today there are merger regulations under telecom trai there are merger regulations under irda there are merger regulations under sebi so if you see 80% and having done so many mergers 80% of the merger requirement are same only sector specific specific and extras or schedules can be given i think it's a huge opportunity for the law makers also to make life simpler for everyone and to do the thing and i think uh, uh, dr anita you mentioned about words like trust transparency i am putting huge emphasis in all the panels on a word collaboration never before we will we got the chance of opening up to each other because what pandemic has done it has made us more humane it has made us more empathetic whenever we had this shadow of arrogance around us so oh, i am this like i was at sequoia director legal sequoia and when i started my own law firm pandemic has taught us the value of appreciating not only our own employees but my fellow friends who are dealing with the same situation and i think if we like what is happening right now is a great collaboration of sharing of thoughts going back to 
you know, with our friends because everyone has experiences and we are sharing it together. But I think I am putting collaboration across regulators. They have to come out of their babudam and say that, you know, these are the best practices. Um, you know, I'm very disappointed, honestly, because government has not come up with a lot of back-end regulatory collaboration and making life simpler for the people. They could have very easily done. I think what industries are doing, because I saw an uh, effort between Indusind Bank and Excess Bank of going together with certain customers and sharing best policies. And I think across the industry, this collaboration, because Sarang is dealing with certain things, Nehal, Rinku, I am dealing, if we are putting it together and avoiding duplication, I think that's one particular word which in future is going to change a lot, is collaboration. Today we are speaking with law firms who are looking into compliances in Austria, in Sweden. Everyone is reaching out to each other and trying to collaborate. That is one. Second, which is such a common thing, is the storage of data at a particular point, right? a singular unit storage of data and following the document storage principle in a very linear fashion. I think that is something which will happen. Now, gone are the time when data could be stored in my C drive and D drive, the cloud and the storage of data. You will see uh, people who were earlier joking about cloud, what is cloud, where it is, there is no rain. I have now realized that, you know, cloud is nothing. It is the way you have to, you know, buck up and that's how you're going to function. So I think the digitization and the storage of data in a very linear fashion and collaboration, I'm, I'm seeing they are going to melt a lot of boundaries and they are going to make a lot of changes in the way we are doing. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, if I may just uh, have a, a short points, I think much has been covered by Rinku and Sandeep, you know, very well. And I, and I agree with thoughts shared by, uh, by both of my co-panelists. I just probably... Uh, touch upon one aspect uh, uh, which I think Rinko and Sandeep both mentioned was uh, is from a customer's perspective in terms of you know um, in the in the situation which we are into and the new normal which we are seeing now I think customers uh, you know expectation towards uh, you know services is uh, is has changed and is going to change rightfully so as well obviously they want convenience um, in their hands um, and they want simple ways of transacting with companies and transacting for their services as well. And that's where the point which my friends have already, already touched is about how digital transformation can help us in this particular aspect. And while much has been spoken from a customer's perspective, my only added point to that is when as companies we are going to use new age tools for um, you know on the back on the back of digital transformation drives it's also going to help us with a lot of audit trail and logs which companies can utilize and use that learn from that and improvise faster than what we used to do earlier now what basically my point is that earlier obviously when there were face to face transactions branch office transactions we used to review our controls and our policies at a particular intervals and backed by audit findings compliance findings risk findings uh, you know etc i think now because of all these digital tools which are there in terms of interactions with the customers interactions within the uh, employee said there will be a lot more data which can come in handy for uh, companies to continue to improvise the processes and this is uh, this is one this is one segment which all of us should uh, we know that but we should utilize for improving the services segment towards our customers that's the limited point which i just wanted to touch upon so uh, from my perspective, of course, all the panelists have uh, covered uh, all the uh, critical points, uh, you know, post uh, COVID. Uh, I would just add uh, some of the things is that, of course, digitization is the way to go for go forward. Of course, most of us have adopted a digital um, as a normal way of life. But at the same time, it is always important to come out uh, with a creative way to deal with the customer and the intention of the entire community you know especially the bfi sector should be that how do we serve our customer the better every day how how we can give them the most comfort every day because if the customer will be there we will be there 
and you know that's how it would be from my perspective thank you so much so when you're saying customers even internal customers all of them we should take equal care uh, sure. not just the external so i'm sure you meant uh, yes all of that so thank you rinku sharma so much for your time nehal shah sandeep kapoor saran chima it's been wonderful interacting with all of you and we hope that the next year we are going to meet at compliance 10 10 face to face at a wonderful location and get to interact but thank you so much for your time i would say the key words that are sticking in my mind we got a pause button to stop we think we look and we must take our learning forward if we don't do that we've lost this whole opportunity so transparency trust resilience agility collaboration are the key themes that we should work with thank you dear panelists for this wonderful session it was extremely enriching uh, we request you to join us in the speakers lounge and the audience will get an opportunity to interact with you and ask you questions so thank you so much thank you once again for all your time appreciate thank you, thank you everyone enjoy thank you everyone thank you everyone Thank you Dr. Shantaram and the rest of our panelists for that extremely insightful conversation.